We are talking about exponential logistic modeling. In the previous lesson, we talked about the exponential function, the logistic function. We talked about what they look like, how you move them and transform them. Today, we're going to do more modeling and talk about the stuff, uh, talk about the base a lot more. Okay. Now, the constant percentage rate and exponential functions. So, suppose that the population is changing at a constant percentage rate, R, where R is the percent rate of change expressed in decimal form. Then the population follows the, uh, the pattern shown, okay? Our initial population is P sub 0. Okay, that's always your initial population. Now, the next year, it's going to be your initial population plus your initial population times the rate of change. If you factor out your initial population, we'll have the initial population times 1 plus R. Now, the next year, year two, we're going to take this initial population times 1 plus r, which is p of 1, multiply it by 1 plus r again. Kind of the same idea we did here. So my new initial population is this. That's my new initial population. We get p, uh, the initial population times 1 plus r quantity squared. You keep doing that. And you'll eventually get P of T is equal to the initial population times 1 plus R to the T power. So it turns out population will be an exponential function of time. Where P of 0 is the initial population, R is expressed as a decimal, and T is going to be the time in years. Now, if R is greater than 0, so if the rate is greater than 0, then it's going to be an exponential growth function. Its growth factor is the base of the exponential function 1 plus R. That's going to be its growth factor. If the rate is less than 0, the base 1 plus R will be less than 1, then P of T is an exponential decay function, and 1 plus R is the decay factor. If you didn't quite get it with the 1 plus R's and all that stuff, we'll get into it here in example 1. All right? Now, in example one, this should look, this formula should look familiar to you. This was a previous example, the population of San Jose. Okay, from the previous example in 3.1. So we need to find, or we need to tell whether the function is an exponential growth or exponential decay function and find a constant percentage rate of growth or decay. So what we're going to have here, we're going to look at our base. We know 1 plus r is going to be 1.0136. How do I solve for r? Subtract 1. So r will be 0 0.0136. Is this number bigger than 0? Yes. So therefore, this is a p of t will be exponential growth and my growth rate will be 1.36%. So going back to San Jose, it was a 1.3% or 1.36% per year of growth for San Jose. That's what they were predicting. Now, if we do the same thing for B, 1 plus R will equal 0.9858. That means in our calculator, to subtract 1, 0.9858 will be 0 0.0142, so a negative 0 0.0142. Because that number is less than zero, is this exponential growth or exponential decay? Exponential decay. Therefore, my decay rate be 1.42%. Do I need to put the negative on there? Because it was, R was a negative 0 0.0142. Do I need to put one point, negative 1.42%? Why? 
because it already says decay. So because it says decay, we know it's a negative already. Are there any questions on example one? You all should like this section much much more even than section three one. Okay. Now, example two, finding an exponential function. Determine the exponential function that satisfies the given conditions. Well, our original function, t of t equals the initial function, 1 plus r to the t divided by, uh, divided by the change in t. Now, the reason I do that is more for example b, or 2b, and example 3. That's why I put that in there. So what it's doing, it's increasing at a rate something per year. So the change in t is just going to be 1 in this case. So my p of t, what is my initial population? My initial population is 12. What's my r as a decimal? r is 0 0.08. t divided by change in t, well my change in t will be 1. When I simplify this, here's my function. A lot of where this is used, where I use it personally, if I'm at the store, say I'm at Kohl's buying something, and I want to figure out how much it is with tax. Yeah. Our tax rate is how much here? 5%. So if I take, usually in algebra class in the past, what you guys did, you took the price, and you multiplied by the tax, right? And took the original price plus whatever the tax was, add together, right? What you can do now, you can take your price, multiply that by 1.05, and then you get your total price of the tax. Does that make sense? Okay? That's really what we're doing in this case. Okay, because we'll take the price, the original price, plus the price times the tax. Okay, that gives us the same thing. Right. Now, I'd like you guys to work on B at this time. All right, in this one here, the initial value is 5. So P of T will equal 5, 1 plus 0.17 T divided by 1, because it is per year. So my P of T will equal 5 times 1.17 to the T. Are there any questions on example 2? No, it won't really get harder than this. Yes, Michael. Because it says per year, that's the change. That's the change. All right, moving on to example three. So we're talking about exponential growth and decay models. Now, exponential growth and decay models are used for populations of animals, bacteria, and even radioactive atoms. Exponential growth and decay apply to any situation where the growth is proportional to the current size of the quantity of interest. That's gonna, we're going to talk about that in biology, chemistry, business, and other social sciences. Exponential growth models can be developed in terms of the time it takes a quantity to double. On the flip side, exponential decay models can be developed in terms of the time it takes a quantity to be halved. Okay, example three through five easy strategies. Super easy. Now, determine the exponential function that gives the current or give satisfies the given conditions. Initial population is 100, doubling every hour. When will the bacteria number 350,000? Okay. So, our original thing, P of T, our initial population is 100, right? When it says doubling every hour, what's my rate? My rate is 100%, right? So you'll see, so 1, and then T divided by 1, which will actually be this. We simplify. That's where the two comes from. Okay? So when we're doubling something, that's where the two comes from. If it was a tripling something, it'd be a three. If it was quadruple, it'd be a four. 
all right? We want to see where this thing equals 350,000. Oh, that's 35. Let's try 350. Okay. What do you think we're going to do here? What do you think we're going to do? Don't have to do that yet. How about we just do this? Put in your calculator, 100 times 2 to the x, and then 350,000 in your second one. Okay? A good uh, x window, I would use 0 to say 20. Oops. And I would go 0 to 500,000. Now I'm using 500,000 because I want to see where it's going to be 350,000, right? So I want to give myself some room. Now when you graph this, you're going to get your equation looks just like this. See where it intersects. So number 5, 11.77 hours. So in 11.77 hours, there would be 350,000 bacteria available. Now, for part B, this is where the change in T comes in, okay? This one is doubled every hour. This one, we're doubling every seven and a half hours. So my initial population, now because it's doubling, and we went through the methodology last time, because it's doubling, we could just call this a 2. We'll have this. We want to see where it's going to be 500,000. So in your calculator, okay, just change your equations. I'm going to go 0 to 100, and 750,000, 0 to 750,000. So I need, again, I need some room. It says, I want to figure out when it's 500,000, so you want to go a little bit above that. Okay. We're going to graph it. Again, we're going to find the intersection. So our T value, 82.24. So our population, the bacteria number 500,000 after 82.24 hours. And if you think about it, after seven and a half hours, well, it starts at zero, so 250. Seven and a half hours would be 500, right? 15 hours would be 1,000. 30 hours, or sorry, 22 and a half hours, it'll be 2,000. It just goes up from that. Okay? Now, we talk about exponential decay. They model the, the amount of radioactive substance present in a sample. The number of atoms in a specific element that change from radioactive state to non-radioactive state is a fixed fraction per unit time. The process is called radioactive decay, and the time it takes for half of a sample to change its state is the half-life of the radioactive substance. 
Okay. Now, the half-life of a certain radioactive substance is 14 days. There are 6.6 .6 grams present initially. When will there be one gram of substance remaining? So, the 6.6 uh, .6 times. Now, so because it says half-life, are we going to use two or are we going to use one half? We use half. So, 1 plus R will be 1 plus negative 0.5, because that's what R is. So, we get 0.5 or 1 half. And that's T divided by 14. We want to see when there's going to be one gram present. Are we okay on that? Now again, let's put it into our calculators. That's why we have these tools. Now again, our window, I would go window here of 0 to 50, and uh, 0 to 10. Now the reason I go 0 to 50, if you think about it, if it's half every 14 days, starts here, after 14 days there's going to be 3.3 grams, right? After 28 days, there's going to be half of that, correct? So it's going to be, you're going to be adding 14 days quite a bit here, okay? Now you go 0 to 10 here because my max is 6.6 .6 grams. Let's find our intersection. 38.11. I'd like you guys to work on B. No, All right. Now in this one here, it says the half-life of a certain radioactive substance is 65 days. There's three and a half grams present initially. When will there be one gram? So, so 3.5 times one half to the T over 65. And again, we want to see where this is going to be 1. Now, a lot of you notice that we wanted to change this. We want to change our window, which is good. We want to change our window to, say, 200, let's say. 150 would have been fine as well. I just made mine 200 just for kicks. So your intersection will be at 117 days. So T will be about 117.48 days. Now, are there any questions on examples three and four at all? To establish an atmospheric pressure at sea level is 14.7 pounds per square inch, and the pressure is reduced by half every 3.6 miles above sea level. For example, the pressure 3.6 miles above sea level is half of 14.7 or 7.35 pounds per square inch. This rule for atmospheric pressure does hold for altitudes up to 50 miles above sea level. Though the context is different, the mathematics for atmospheric pressure closely resembles the mathematics of radioactive decay. So if we look at example five, determine the altitude when the atmospheric pressure is four pounds per square inch. Well, I know it's going to start at 14.7 pounds per square inch. And it drops by half every 3.6 miles. So height over 3.6 miles. We want to see when it's going to be four. Okay. So my initial pressure at a given height is 14. So my initial pressure 
at zero height is 14.7 pounds per square inch. It's going to reduce by half every 3.6 miles. So just like we had it with the time, how it doubles every hour, doubles every seven and a half hours, the change in height here is 3.6 miles. That's where that 3.6 comes from. So I'm, again, I'm going to graph it. So put in 14.7 times 1 half to the x divided by 3.6. We want to see where it's going to be 4. Now, a window that I would use here, I would go 0 to, say, 10 miles. I'd go 0 to 20 miles for the height. And the reason I'd go 20 miles, or 20, uh, not 20 miles tonight, 20 PSI, because it starts at 14.7 PSI. That's why I do that. So again, we're going to graph it. So the higher you get, the less pressure there is. So our intersection be 6.76 miles. So your height's going to be about 6.76 miles above sea level. That's when the pressure is going to be 4 pounds per square inch. And that makes sense because every 3.6 miles it goes by half, right? So at 3.6 miles it's 7.5 or 7.35 pounds per square inch. At 7.2 miles it'll be less than 4. So somewhere between 3.6 and 7.2 will be 4 pounds per square inch. And that's what we have there for our difference. Now, Usually I'd have you do problem B, but this one's going to be a little bit different, okay? First things first, this gives us gives it to us in feet, but the problem before that, the introduction gave it to us as miles, right? So let's change 52,800 feet to miles. How many miles is this? Ten miles, right? There's 5,280 feet in a mile. <coughs> Multiply it by 10, you get 52,800 feet. So again, we want to find the pressure at 10 miles This one's going to be a little bit different. We're finding the pressure. We're not finding the altitude. Where is this pressure? So we know the height that we want to deal with. We just don't know what the pressure will be at that height. Does that make sense? So that's why we put it into the equation that we have. So really, all you would do here is plug this into the equation. And you get your answer of 2.14 pounds per square inch. So again, you have to know what you're looking for when you're dealing with these equations. Okay? So that's how I put it in the calculator. Now, are there any questions on example five? Now, tomorrow we're going to go over example six, seven, and eight. It shouldn't take us very long. It's going to be more using uh, regressions to find these. So we're going to use um, exponential regression and logistic regression. So if there's no questions, you guys have the rest of the time to work on your homework.